Hank! Back to the Future is one of those trilogies I love. I already looked at the first one, so why don't I take a look at Back to the Future Part 2? Alright, Back to the Future 2. It's been a while since I last talked about, you know, Back to the Future. You know, that was back in April. But, <laughs> we're on to my favorite installment. Yes, this is my favorite installment, more than the first one. Now, some people <laughs> think this is the worst one. Uh, some people think the third one's the worst one. Most people agree the first one is the best one. Uh, I don't. I believe the second one is better. But, I, I enjoy the entire trilogy. This one starts with a retread of the final scene from the first movie, you know, to get you caught, caught up. This was, this was four years after the first movie came out. I've seen these movies multiple times, so I don't think I really need to talk about the first scene in this movie. You know, it's just the same one that's in the first movie. It's the final scene in that, and it leads to the second one. And, you know... Honestly, I kind of just wish there's like some cut that someone makes of all three movies just into like one, I don't know, like four and a half hour movie or something. Be and like no cuts, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to like get uh, go off the one and then go to the next. It's just all one whole thing. I think that'd be really cool. But anyways, Marty, Doc, and Jennifer they go to the future. I don't know why Jennifer even really goes. Just plot sake, she doesn't even really need to be there, because Doc just stuns her to make her forget, he's like, I couldn't just leave her there, but it's like, why couldn't you just use it when she was there, and then leave her on, like, Marty's porch, or something, ah, I don't know, just, like, something like that, okay, like, it, it's, it's literally just there, because the script demands it, and you will see later, it, it's one of the flaws of this almost perfect movie, but, I mean, not everything is perfect, you know? So, the future scenes mostly just focus on Marty, as he tries posing as a son to say no to Griff, Biff's grandson, which, wait, he has a grandson? He, it's not shown that he has a kid in the first movie by that point, and if, even if he did, like, a day later or something, that wouldn't make sense, because it's also shown he's in no relationship at all, even... Even the old, like, the old man version of Biff. Not in a relationship at all. And so, meaning, that's only a 30-year gap. And if Griff is supposed to be 17, the same age as, you know, Marty's son, meaning, he would have to be born in 1998, because they go to 2015. Meaning, if Biff had a kid at that time, that kid would be 13! When he, when he or she became a father-slash-mother to Griff. I don't know. I don't. I don't know why they just didn't write him as Biff's like son or something. Like again, he's old, you know, so it wouldn't make sense. And also, like him basically, Griff basically abusing Biff, you know, his grandpa or whatever. It, it wouldn't be so good if he was, you know, doing that to his old man. So like, I get it. It's just kind of something weird. But anyways, you know, there's some future funny jokes and stuff. But they they, they do basically the same scene as they do. In the first movie in the 50s, but in the future, and what I think is arguably a way cooler scene, mostly because of the hoverboard, but you know. And also, uh, something I forgot to mention this movie introduces the chicken thing, you know, to Marty. Some people like this, some people don't. Something that adds like a character flaw to him, like flaw as in like a good flaw, you know, to like challenge his character or whatever, you know, give him more character. But some also think it's bad because it's just a cheap plot device for, you know, a bunch of the actions, like the bad action, like the bad decisions to happen in this movie. And I get both sides, but I think this was actually a good change. But anyways, that future stuff happens, you know, basically the scene that I already mentioned. So, Marty, later you see him like this is kind of like after all this, he tries getting a sports almanac because he gets an idea from this guy to get a sports almanac, travel back in time, bet on, you know, like, the winners or whatever, because, you know, they have a book of basically all the winners, and then become super rich. But Doc's like, he invented the time machine for the good, so he makes Marty throws it away, but old Biff overhears this. And let's just say, he's got a evil idea. <laughs> I don't know why I'm doing that. You also find out that the police took Jennifer, Marty's girlfriend, back to their future house, because, you know, DNA and stuff or whatever. So it takes them there. So Marty and Doc have to go there, and this is what I'm talking about, the script thing. So Jennifer 
get stuck in their house, and you get to see what Marty and Jennifer, you know, the future house is gonna look like and stuff. But Doc gets Jennifer back. Marty's just standing there. He's supposed to be guarding the DeLorean, but he's just standing there, like, again, just so the script demands it. Like I said, this movie is flawed. But you see, old Biff goes back in time. Well, you don't actually see him go back in time. We see him get in the DeLorean, fly away, and come back. And you see him, like, thriving in pain. And then there's a deleted scene, which I feel like they honestly shouldn't have cut. In this scene, you see Biff in pain again, so you get to see more of it. But you actually see the reason why he's in pain. Because before, like, when I first saw this movie, it was like, why is he in pain? But the reason why is because he's getting erased from existence. Anyways, Marty and Doc go back to 1985. And it's not the same as when they left. Because old Biff has altered the timeline to where, you know, Biff, like, the younger version of him would grow up to be a evil, rich, like, stinking rich businessman to where he legalizes gambling and owns this giant tower, you know, it's been in other movies and stuff too. And honestly, this might be my favorite part of the movie. They completely changed Hill Valley into Hell Valley. And the imagery is just really cool if I'm being completely honest. And the scene where Marty tries going in his house, and it's that like, family, and he's like, oh, I messed up, and he's like, darn right you messed up! <laughs> if I'm being completely honest, that is probably my favorite scene of the entire movie. Ironically and unironically, it's hilarious. But you get to see what it's like, you know, in the alternate 1985. And again, they deleted a scene, which I'm kind of mixed about whether they should have cut. You see Marty go to the school, well, kind of, you just see, you know, him, like, looking on at the school. And it's just, like, burning and stuff. It looks pretty weird because it looks like it's not even in the same area, basically. But... Yeah, like I said, really cool imagery and one of my favorite parts of the movie. But you see him watch the video of Biff, like the history video, and when you find out he's married Marty's mom, he, he just starts screaming. And then those three guys, like uh, Biff's henchmen from the first movie and stuff, like I, I know I know them most because the one guy wears the 3D glasses. They take Marty and knock him out, and then you see him wake up. And you see the alternate version of Marty's mom. You also finally get to see in person the alternate version of Biff. And, you know, he's a huge jerk. You know, and stuff. So, Marty... So, basically, his mom tells him... Because Marty's so confused. His mom's like, oh, you must have just got hit in the head. Tells him where his father is. And so he goes into the cemetery to look. And <laughs> you, you get a funny piece of war. I don't know if they showed this at all in the first movie. But he's shown to be born April 1st. <laughs> Bro, I, I don't know what I'm on. I think I'm on, like, drugs or something. Anyways, I honestly feel like this scene could have been better if Marty's mom said, Well, your dad's in the same place he's been in for the past 12 years, I believe. 12 years? And then she says Oak Park Cemetery. I honestly feel like it would have been better if she said, just said past 12 years. And then it cuts to Marty at the grave, so, you know, that way it's way more shocking. Like, it's still shocking nevertheless, but I just feel like it would have been more shocking, you know? Anyways, Marty meets back up with Doc, and Doc tells him what happened, because Marty is just so confused. So he goes to confront Biff about it, but then Biff says, you know, because he says his relative, like his distant relative or whatever, gave it to him. He's like, I don't see any resemblance, but he said, if a wide-eyed scientist or a kid comes up asking about that book and then, you know, he pulls out his gun and then there's this really cool scene. We see those three henchmen guy chasing Marty does the cool thing with the stairs. But then Biff comes out with the gun and they're on the rooftop. A really cool scene. Marty looks down. It looks like something from, like, a Batman movie or something. And so basically this is a scene that doesn't really make sense if you look at the logic but doc comes back up because you see marty jump but he lands on the delorean doc comes up hits biff with the door but you know in real life that wouldn't make sense i i don't really care that much i still think it's a really cool scene but then marty and doc go back to 1955 because doc tells him earlier that if they go to 2015 to fix the timeline from biff never getting that it would be the timeline where Biff is super rich, but he's just 
older, so the timeline would still be messed up. So they have to go back to 1955, and they do a and you know the rest of the movie is kind of like lazy, but at the same time, it's really cool because you see Marty having to go back to 1955 in order to stop old Biff from giving it to the younger Biff, and they just kind of did this to revisit the first movie, you know, the easier scene. And something I actually found out about is that you know obviously movies are way from out of order, but the future stuff was actually filmed last. And then the 1955 stuff was like super close to being like the first stuff they filmed, I'm pretty sure. It's kind of random, but I mean, it's interesting, I guess. And so yeah, the rest of the movie is basically just similar to the first one, except you see it from a different point of view, like at different places and stuff. But then he ends up at the school dance, you know, yada yada yada, all that stuff that basically happens from the first movie, just a tiny bit different, you know, different scenes. You get to see it from, you know, another version of Marty's perspective. But then Biff finds him and is like, what are you doing over here? He's like, taking my stuff. So Biff takes the almanac. Marty has to chase him down into the tunnel that Biff uh, goes and chases it down. And then he has to get all the way back to the other side of the tunnel. But Biff in his car is chasing him. And, you know, it's like the final big, like, thing of the movie. If I'm being completely honest, it's anticlimactic. Especially because in the first movie they show, Marty can just make the skateboard go under the car and then walk over on the other side. And even then, if he gets hit, the car is going like a million miles an hour. It's just going to be pressed against the car. So kind of anticlimactic, but still a cool scene. And you guys know this kite that Doc brings. You know, in a storm, you know, because from the first movie. And then Doc gets struck by lightning, and spoilers, I guess, gets sent back to 1885 as this guy from, like, the post office gives him a letter. And that's where the movie basically ends. And, and the third part's about to happen, you know, leading to the third part. And that's the plot. Pretty good, honestly. It's probably the biggest plot, like the most convoluted one of all of them. But yeah, I, I think it's the best plot out of all of them, easily. Look, when I say I mean it's like the best plot easily, I, I don't really mean that. It's just to me, it's the best plot easily. Or at least the biggest plot easily. You cannot argue with that, because the other two just take place in one timeline. This one, or time period. This one goes into three, and it, they each go back and back 30 years. This movie, something about it, it's the most high energy one. It probably has the least emotion, probably has the least amount of character depth. Not depth, depth. Depth, yeah, I, I cannot say words. I, I'm not, I'm, I have a speech impediment, basically. I, I cannot say words very well. But, I think this movie excels in almost every level. You know, some of the stuff in the future kind of sucks, you know, basically just stuff the script demands. But it's a really high energy plot, high stakes. I think it's cool. Like I said, the alternate 1985 is, it's so cool. Like, seeing this alternate reality where Biff has taken over. And people say each of the Back to the Future stories, or each one, is themed mostly around a character. The first one is themed after Marty's dad, George. The second one is the Biff story. And then the third one is the Doc story. None of them are themed after Marty. But I guess the series as a whole is themed after Marty. You know, all three of them. And, you know, I, I cannot argue with that. And Biff, out of all three of those characters, Marty's dad, Doc Brown, and Biff, he's probably my favorite. Tom Wilson does an absolute outstanding performance. Easily probably the best actor in any of the movies. And in real life, he's actually the most chill and friendly. I, every, everyone knows this now. But he, he's just a really nice guy. Like, I, I heard this like story, like people are taking like pictures with him or something, like with the cast. And like none of the other people like wanted to do it or whatever, you know, they were just kinda like uh, But Thomas F. Thomas F. Wilson, I cannot again I cannot say words was ecstatic about it. He he's a he's a really cool guy. I, I'd like to eventually meet him someday. And you know, I haven't really talked about it much. I mentioned it earlier. But the hoverboard. The hoverboard is like the coolest back to the future thing. If you said the hoverboard wasn't cool, you're probably not, like, a real one, you know? You're not, like, an epic gamer, like all of us the epic g g gamers. The hoverboard is one of the coolest things to come out of film ever. And in, like, the making of the Back to the Future trilogy, or, like, Secrets or whatever that one VHS, Robert Zemeckis, I believe it was, said, oh, yeah, there were some, like, old toys that we called, but we got our hands on them. What a trick in us. Bro, they made an entire handful of kids 
think hoverboards existed. Th that was a pretty cool trick. But I mean, it was also, he's kind of a legend if I'm being completely honest. It was a cruel thing to do, but it was honestly like one of the funniest things too if I'm being completely honest. And, you know, there was that whole Crispin Glover lawsuit thing, like, you didn't like the ending of the first movie, like, the money equals happiness, so a lawsuit came, you can't play, like, another character can't play, like, an actor or whatever, like, use the face of his mold, and it was all that stuff, and they literally flipped a guy upside down, that's why he has back pains, that way it looks less like him, and you, like, barely see the shots of him whenever it's, like, at the school dance, you know, it, it, it's whatever, I guess, um, also, the actress who played Jennifer isn't even in, uh, this one. Uh, I think she left because, like, her mom was, like, sick or something in the hospital. So I got another actress to play her. It's sad that this movie is the worst rated of all of them, but I love it. It's my favorite. It's also the one I own the mer most merchandise of. Because, like, I own this, like, Marty McFly figure, a Playmobil set. I recently just got the entire trilogy on, you know, on DVD. It's not just Back to the Future 2. I also got three posters of all all the movies lined up on my walls. I had to, like, measure them and stuff out. You know, I, I love this movie. I'll never stop loving this movie, even if I end up enjoying the first one a lot more. The second one is probably always going to be my favorite. That, wouldn't, I, I, that kind of just contradicted myself. But like I said, I'll always love this movie. There's no denying that. I will always love this movie. <laughs> like, what? what? <laughs> I'm speechless. I can't say anything. It's just everything this movie does is so great, but like so bad, sort of, at the same time, but it doesn't make the movie bad, it's good, it's goofy, it, it knows, it, it knows it's, like, not as, like, good and emotional as the other one, or even the third one, you know, it just won't have a good time, and like I said, it's a different plot compared to the third one, that was one of my big issues with the third one, it was basically just the same plot as the first one, sort of, uh, it, it does change up a lot more things, um, we'll talk about the third one eventually, but yeah, I love this movie, it also got some tie-in games, on the NES we got Back to the Future 2 and 3, that was a game based on both. It's kind of weird because the first Back to the Future game got released in 89, four years after the movie, and Bob Gale wanted them to change it. But LJN was basically already done with the game, I believe, and uh, they just decided to still release it. I don't know why they couldn't delay it more. Like It was still four years after the movie. I get when the movie came out, the NES wasn't a big, super big thing yet. Heck, that's when the first Mario came out. But... Y you know, it's just kind of weird. But Back to the Future 2 or 3, I, I hear it is actually worse, maybe, than them. I believe it just starts out with the alternate 1985, which is kind of weird. It doesn't even really look like it that much. Another uh, Back to the Future game that actually is pretty good, I've heard, at least decent, is Super Back to the Future 2. Only released in Japan in 1993 for the Super Famicom in America at Super Nintendo. I'd like to eventually own this game, at least a replica of it, maybe even the original too. I know on the Super Nintendo you can like very easily make it region free, so that's pretty cool. It has a chibi anime art style, and it's just kind of weird, you know, it's voiced like years after the movie, and it's just based off the second one. And, you know, speaking of games and stuff like that, I would like them to eventually make a game with the entire trilogy. You know, like a movie with the entire trilogy, a game where you play the entire trilogy. Granted, like I said on the NES, like, you know, you, you technically can play the entire trilogy, but it's not just one game. I heard the best Back to the Future game is Back to the Future The Game, which was released in 2010, I believe. But it's more like a point and click. It's more like a story game. You know, and I've never been that big a fan of games with huge stories. Like, I love Sonic Adventure 2, but that's because it also has gameplay. This game probably is good, and I'm just not giving it a chance. You know, nitpicking on something because that was just play praising the second one a bunch. So my brain is just wanting to nitpick something. I don't know why. Let's not talk about that. Let's talk about the good stuff. This movie is amazing. It's a must-watch. Eh, dependable. <laughs> uh, I guess on what your interests are. But, you know, I, I love this movie. I've said this a million times. It's great. Easily better than the first one, in my opinion, and the third one. And I love this movie. I, bro, I keep saying the same thing over and over. Back to the Future's great. There, that, done. And so that was Back to the Future Part 2.